Hello and welcome everybody to the second of Planted Save Our Soils talks brought to you in partnership with the National Trust and filmed on the deck of our beautiful off-grid cabin made by our friends at Out of the Valley. My name's Sam Peters, I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the only design event aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. At Planted we want to make the commercial case for nature and we'll be discussing how food, farming, architecture, design and nature can combine to create a cleaner, greener, more sustainable future. In this series of talks, we're exploring why the earth is important for food, farming and nature and asking what role design can play in encouraging the use of local materials while reducing demand for our already overstretched natural resources. Today, in this second talk of the series, we're exploring a fascinating, complex and sometimes challenging subject for those of us interested in how we enable nature while also producing food more sustainably, namely rewilding and regenerative farming. And I'm delighted to welcome four of the country's leading experts in this field. <laughs> to, to my left, <laughs> Jill Butler, Forest of Selwood Group. For two decades, Jill had a specialist interest in ancient and other veteran trees and forests, wood pastures and parkland. She has a deep understanding of the history and structure of past landscapes and a passion for learning about the important ecological aspects of managing open grazed forests which la with large herbivores. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Jill and her Forest of Selwood group for the support that they've given Planted throughout the process of putting this on. Um, to Jill's left, Derek Gow, author of the magnificently named Bringing Back the Beaver. Derek owns a farm in Devon, much of which is under the process of rewilding. His farm is home to many species, including Eurasian lynx, wild boar, beavers, white storks and harvest mice. And Derek is renowned as one of the UK's leading environmentalists. It's a privilege to have you here. Tom Carver. Tom is director and head cheesemaker at Westcombe Dairy. Tom's primary lessons in cheesemaking came whilst working at Neil's Yard. And after moving back to Somerset to work on his family farm, Tom began exploring the microbial diversity of the farm and its milk, together with the moral aspects of food production. And I must say again, Tom, on a personal level, um, his magnificent charcuterie is available in the Pilton Cider Bar in the, uh, in the Botanical Market, and I highly recommend it. It's absolutely magnificent. Uh, and finally, but by no means least, Ben Raskin, Head of Horticulture and Agroforestry at the Soil Association. Ben has worked in horticulture for more than 25 years and has been with the Soil Association since 2006. He co-chairs co the DEFRA Edibles Horticulture Roundtable, sits on the boards of the Organic Growers Alliance and Community Supported Agricultural Network UK and is also on the com committee of the Farm Woodland Forum. Ben, thank you so much for joining us as well. So that's our panel. I'm not going to start by giving you a precy of what this subject's about and what we're going to be talking about because, as, as I've said, there's four people on the panel who know a lot more about this than I do. But what I'd really like to, to start off with, guys, if I may, and I'll, I'll start with you, Jill, if that's OK, just let's try and get to the bottom of what rewilding actually is and how does rewilding possibly relate to farming? Gosh, that's a, a, just a snippet of a question, <laughs> isn't it, really? Um, one of the reasons that I'm here is because um, the forest of Selwood goes back uh, 1100 years or more, back to Anglo-Saxon times. And uh, it was the, one of the chosen wildest areas by the Anglo-Saxon kings. And it had a distinct identity as a wild area, uh, which stayed right the way through until after, uh, after the Elizabethan era. So for half a millennium, the forest of um, Selwood was in existence. Now you may say, well, where is the forest of Selwood? Well, you're in it. Um, it stretches from this side of the border in Wiltshire, just a bit further, further east, uh, across to Chester Blades. If you know where Chester Blades is, if you're local on the far side, um, from Charlton Musgrove in the south up to north of Froome. And really it takes in four uh, Anglo-Saxon hundreds, which was an administrative area under the Anglo-Saxons. Now, what they meant by wild and what they meant by forest was a very open landscape. And more recently, we've called it a park-like landscape. So it's absolutely fantastic that we are located in Stourhead Park because this is more akin to what the landscape used to be and the wild landscape used to be, a much more open landscape so that you had the large herbivores actually 
uh, roaming through. And of those, the deer were the most prized of all. And we've had a love affair with deer for absolutely thousands of years because you only need to go to the cave paintings of Southern Europe, but actually not just even Southern Europe. You can go to Nottinghamshire, to Cresswell Crags, and you can see the carved deer in the caves at Cresswell Crags. So we have really, really loved the animals of the historic forest, which were the large, large herbivores, the wild cattle, the wild deer, the wild horses. Sadly, many of those original wild animals have gone extinct. So sometimes I hear wilders say, well, you, you, can't, you can't do wilding with large herbivores because um, they're, they're farmed animals, you know, you can't do it. Well, I'm sorry, we just cannot bring back at the moment uh, actual wild aurochs or, or the old cattle or wild uh, horses because we allowed them to go extinct. But they are very good analogues of the situation. So just also to say that to ground us in terms of the soils as well and their landscape, this is a very special area as well because the River Stour rises just up over the crest there. And that is, this is why this is called Stour Head. So it's the top of that catchment of the Stour, which winds its way down to uh, Christchurch, I believe. Two other rivers, uh, on the eastern side of um, the Forest of Selwood rise in this area and wend their way down that side, down that way to the coast, to the channel. And then on the other side of this ridge, you've got two other rivers, two other very, very important rivers. The Brew, which is so important for the Somerset levels, and also the Froome as well. So five catchments actually merging here and it's very important that this wilded area is at its best so that we can set the scene right from the top downwards, as they say. Thanks, Jill. Uh, Derek, talking of rivers, obviously your, your book, which is available in the Fold Bookshop here at Planted, uh, Bringing Back the Beaver, is a, an example of an amazing reintroduction process that you have driven. But can you explain a little bit about why? <coughs> what's your motivation for bringing these... these um, extinct species in the UK back back to these shores? Um, I think the motivation changes with the species. So as far as beavers are concerned, um, when you look at the arguments about the, re the return of the creature or not returning the creature, and you look at some of the farming press from Tayside and the medieval barbarities that have risen there very quickly um, to defeat this animal because it takes land and because it, it causes issue with something that we have laid out like a checkerboard that was once wild but is now entirely tame with virtually no organisms left in much of the soils with livers that are polluted um, and lifeless. Beavers take environments like this and by creating <coughs> impoundments and felling trees, they return them to life. You have to be an incredibly ignorant person not to understand that. And it's a tragedy at the beginning of the 21st century when we have the best forms of communication available to, uh, to uh, us as a species that we've ever had that some people just don't get the message. So my motivation has been actually, it was derived from him. See that old man sitting there <laughs> with those misty, smelly glasses? <laughs> <laughs> That's Ted Green. And I think maybe um, he's very, very old, OK? So I think maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago, he was in Country File and um, talking about beavers in the Netherlands at a time when they just reintroduced them there. And, and, you know, you look at this, this, this madman talking about beavers and think, well, actually, why can't we do it here? And the more you ask that question and the more you were beaten off with really quite stupid platitudes, the more you looked at the platitudes and thought, well, that's not a reason. And you start to become more and more interested. You travel to Russia, North America, Germany, to, to countries like Belgium, where they reintroduced them in 2000. And, and where they, you know, in taking over the bottom valley farmed old landscapes and re-wetting them to create environments that are incredibly complex, they've enabled the return of species like the black stork, which were extinct. So beavers are the generators of life, and that was why it was so incredibly important to bring them back. 
When it comes to other species, there are different reasons for doing it. If Roy Dennis were sitting here, he would tell you the white-tailed eagle is being brought back to the Isle of Wight because it challenges us. It takes very little from us. Maybe it takes sheep carrion. It does not kill ever very many lambs. But anything that has taken anything from us traditionally, ever since we stood on our hind legs, came down from the trees in Africa and our tails dropped off, has provoked one response, and that has been we kill it. And we've come now, at, the, at this time, at the beginning of the 21st century, throughout most of this planet, to a point where our cycle of killing has not terminated with the carnivorous animals and the primitive people. It's terminated with tiny organisms, tiny animals like water voles or harvest mice that don't exist in environments like this. When you sit on this field in your scratchy straw bale in your summer outfits, look at your feet. There won't be a field vole burrow here. And even though it's a pleasant surrounding and it's very pretty, we as a species have reduced most of the rest of this planet to a point that is approaching near death. So when it comes to rewilding, what rewilding is for me is not turning around saying, see these old woodlands, we're going to put 300 cattle or 50, 50 reconstituted aurochs or a moose or whatever else into them. Because some of these incredibly delicate fragments of nature which are, are left on this island have been wrought and cultivated and cared for and challenged and, 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 and made beautifully complex in so many ways by our past cultural activities. Rewilding is taking shit land like this and saying, you know, it ain't going to be a tidy pasture anymore. Those boar are going in there for a year. They're going to rip the hell out of it. They're going to change the floristic structure completely. And the shit, the, the, the mycorrhizal fungi, is going to be distributed out from the last remaining trees into the pasture. And we're going to use animals as tools to help us kickstart life. And then we're going to become more ambitious. We're going to look at the eagles and the white storks, the birds of hope that have, 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 have generated such a response from the reintroduction project at Nep Castle at a time of COVID and plague. And then we're going to pragmatically work our way forwards, looking at the small carnivores that we smashed in the Middle Ages and ultimately getting our young people to ask why there can't be wolves here. There's no reason why there can't be wolves in this landscape other than lazy farming and cultural stupidity. They're right up to the Channel Coast now challenging people in environments that are much more developed like this. Rewilding is about changing attitudes. Fantastic. <laughs> I was going to give you a round of applause there myself, Derek, so I'm glad the crowd beat me to it. Um, inspiring stuff. Um, Tom Carver from Westcombe Dairy, follow that. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> uh, Tom, uh, Derek's obviously described a landscape and a, and a land and earth which is becoming bereft of life. Um, we've destroyed so much of the earth beneath our feet through chemical processes, through just accepting that the only way we can produce food is on a sort of industrialised scale. Um, uh, is that true? And second to that... Um, why is it so important for good quality food, and I mean food which has all the nutritional benefits and the taste and all those things that we really cherish and perhaps have been lost over time, to have soil with lit which is alive? Yeah, so, uh, crikey. Um, I think it's really important just from a flavour perspective. I think that, that one of the things that you can't really deny out of that all what, what we do on a daily basis is we actually consume and we eat three times a day. So actually we need to work out a way that we can actually farm and produce food in a, in a way that's going to be working alongside nature and also within certain ecosystems. So what we've been looking at at, at Westcombe and like, and I have to say, you know, we, we, we've done our level of damage and we're, we hold our hands up for, to that. Um, but we're really trying to actually uh, wind that back and have an, a deep understanding of how we can actually be better custodians of, of, the, of the land that we actually farm and, and the food that we can produce. And what I've found is fascinating is actually if you look at the quality and flavour profile of what you're actually producing, um, uh, usually if that's your aspiration, everything else actually slots in really, really well. Um, so um, by producing a raw milk um, cheese as we do, 
uh, we're trying to see how we can actually influence the flavour. And the, where we've come to at the moment is the best way of influencing that flavour is having a hugely diverse uh, soil structure and soil microbial activity in the soil. And how we can actually do that is to uh, plant uh, uh, multi-species herbal lays that we're doing. We're going down this kind of um, uh, paddock grazing system. So. Um, uh, so that we can actually um, treat the soil as best as we possibly can. And we're finding that, um, you know, and I have to say we're pretty young into it, we're really excited about the possibility of having diversity of the different uh, paddocks having slightly different diverse flavours on, on the cheese itself, um, which I think is, is, is massive. So I, the other thing as well is, is also um, uh, not necessarily focusing on one thing. So I like the idea of diversity, but not just starting it off in soil, you're starting like seeing what you can actually produce within that soil, so the plants that you're growing. Um, but also, you know, from our business model, I'd really like to have a, a diverse customer, customer base. It's very easy for, for us being raw milk producers to sell to the elite and the, any of the people who can actually afford it, but I think that that's actually wrong of us to do. So we want, want to try and have a diverse customer base. And then we're looking at diversity of the, the food that we can actually grow on our farm. So um, with the help of Ben, we've, um, we've started to plant a load of trees and um, we have, we've, started, we've got a little ice cream company that then we're actually thinking of ways that we can uh, grow the, um, uh, the fruit and the berries for those ice creams um, and make that slightly more season, seasonal so that then those stories and those ideas can be potentially connected with our customer base and our consumers which I think is, um, for me, a really, really important thing um, to connect everybody to the idea of lo localised seasonality um, rather than um, having these crazy ideas of, um, of just focusing on one specific thing. I mean, that is what we've done wrong in farming. We've be become too specialised. You're, you know, uh, 70 odd years ago, you wouldn't have just been a dairy farmer, arable yeah. or pig farmer. You would have this diversity of food that you're producing. Mm. Um, so really that's what we're looking to do. And it's, it's bloody exciting actually, mm. because it's amazing to see that um, all these waste avenues of the different enterprises that are going on, like waste is just a lack of creativity, mm. I think. You can actually, you know, one surprises waste can go feed into the other mm -hmm. and it creates this very complex, holistic system within our business. That's amazing. I mean, they say there is no waste in nature, basically, is there? It's only humans that create waste because everything else in nature becomes food or part of a circular system. So fascinating stuff. Thank you, Tom. Ben, from your perspective um, at the Soil Association, <coughs> What, what have the last couple of years been like? And so it feels like there's a real energy behind this now, a real kind of growing understanding, growing awareness that rewilding isn't some kind of left field thing going on over there that no one can really get their heads around. But what, what, what's it been like for you as an organisation um, to see this sort of change in, in, in public attitudes? And, and indeed, what are you doing for farmers from an advice perspective to, to help them shift perhaps more in this direction? Yes, I mean, I think... Over the last five years, the speed of change is just astonishing. You know, I mean, I've been there 15 years, and for 10 years of that, I was ignored at conferences and told I was, you know, some loony person who, you know, didn't understand the real world. And, and within the space of five years, and over the last couple of years, even more so, that, that change in attitudes has been astonishing, you know, and it's a change in, in farmers' attitudes, so people like Tom, who, you know, are really just passionate about making their farms better but the change in policy makers you know they still don't always understand it and they still get things wrong and they're still are probably you know they're not sort of quite where uh, where Derek is maybe but but you know they're starting <laughs> to understand what might need to be done and what we need to do and that you know the where we've come as, as the others have said where we've come from that situation where almost every farm was a mixed farm and it was producing you know, it was producing its own firewood, its own fruit, you know, a range of crops and animals mm. to the point where, you know, almost all of our vegetables are grown in peatland in the east of England. Where we've lost two metres of soil, you know, there's a post in the ground where showing where the soil used to be and you can stand at the bottom of it. That's just blown away. That's in the 
to see. It's in you know, it's thirty foot over the line. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. unbelievable. So we need we need to work out how we readjust our food system mm. to deal with that, and a lot of that will be down to relo relocalization of the food system. Um, we need to be less specialist, you know, and that means it will be more expensive to produce financially. Um, but actually, we can't afford cheap food. We've been obsessed with cheap food. Um, and that's the root of the problem. We've been driven down this route. Everything has to be more efficient. You know, that's the only way we can survive as a business, as a farmer. You've got to be more efficient. So you either become very small and specialist or you become massive. And that's where a lot of the soil damage comes when you become massive and you have to have big fields and you have to grow the same crop all the time. Um, and, you know, my background is horticulture, which is probably the most damaging things that we grow. You know, we're all supposed to eat more fruit and vegetables, but actually the systems we're currently growing in are, are some of the most damaging systems there are. So how do we move past that? And then, you know, this, you asked me what the Soil Association is doing. You know, one of the, the bits I'm most passionate about is, you know, the rewilding is great. I think it's amazing. And I think we learn a lot from it. I don't think we're in a position to rewild the whole of the country. We still need to produce food. And I think, whereas, you know, meat can be produced <coughs> successfully in very rewilded systems, it's much harder to produce um, arable crops and vegetable crops in those systems. So where we're at is actually looking at what you might call as a sort of halfway house, so the agroforestry bit, which is where you're mixing in trees with farming. Um, and there's some very, very easy wins with livestock farming where you can quickly integrate trees. Um, they provide browse, shade, shelter. You know, they not only improve biodiversity, improve the environment, but they increase productivity for the farmer. So it's actually, it's a win-win situation. Where you're starting to bring crops into it, it gets a bit more complicated, but there's still a lot of wins. Um, so we need to look at integrating fruit trees with vegetable systems. We need to be looking at every farm and every village producing some vegetables. And this is where some of the community supported agriculture that I'm really passionate about as well comes in. You know, the more we can be involved in it, and we don't have to be, all have to be full-time farmers. We don't all have to be full-time vegetable growers. But if we've all got a stake in it, um, we understand better. It's a better livelihood for the farmer and we're close to what we're doing. So it's, you know, how we bring, how we bring all of that together to me, it's a whole mindset change. You can't just sort of tweak at the edges and expect to, you know, to get there. So really we're talking a lot about obviously moving away from monocultures, trying to in, bring diversity into the way we manage the land, the, the, the sort of breadth of uh, animals that, and, and species that we're, we're farming. Um, but Jill, from your perspective, I know from a kind of forestry perspective, I'd like to hear what you think um, in terms of what forests, what woodland should look like, because I think we kind of have an idea in our head that all forests must be kind of thick, cover all, all around, but there's, there's much more nuance to that. Uh, absolutely, and I take Ben's point about um, you know integrating trees into farming as well, because that's a really important uh, role to bring those trees into that those systems because of the reasons that uh, Ben's been talking about. But um, you know the the trees are deep rooted, so they're bringing up deeper nutrients from deeper down than your surface vegetation and through photosynthesis are throwing out through twigs and leaves and uh, regularly uh, nutrients to go back into the system and people will say um, well but that's so negligible that amount of uh, material that they're putting back the, uh, uh, the amount of nutrient is so little but in actual fact the system for picking up those nutrients is so remarkably sophisticated and so deeply evolved that they pick up every single bit of that nutrient as part of the system, if the system is holistic. But what we've probably done is break that completely down through use of uh, chemicals so that um, you know, we're, we're bypassing that really, really sophisticated system. Um, but to go back to your main point, which is that, you know, when I was talking about the, uh, the, the, the wilded forest, what we really think now was that the uh, forest was very much more open rather than closed. You've, you've probably all heard this idea that a, a squirrel could run through the treetops from uh, Dover through to John O'Groats. Well, that may have been possible through a very zigzag route, but there would have been a lot of open space in that particular landscape. Um, 
but it would have been a mix, a mosaic landscape. It would have had uh, a open, open areas. It would have had scrub. Uh, it would have had individual trees, and then it would have had what we would call uh, small, uh, smallish areas of more densely packed trees. And the whole system just, it's a, it's a moving across the landscape sort of picture where it just uh, actually moves across the landscape, creating all of those niches, all of those little um, habitats that are so fantastic for all sorts of wildlife. Now, what we're actually doing a lot of at the moment is actually uh, a forestry style planting. And I'd like to separate those words forestry from forests, really, because forestry is a very uh, worthwhile job of growing timber and we need wood. But it's a bit like agriculture on a long term scale. Uh, you know, we're talking about 60 years rotation as opposed to cabbages that are a single rotation. Um, and uh, we know that those, the system that we're using um, of two by two planting, you've probably all thought, why are we planting so many trees? Well, first of all, why are we planting them when we know that trees can regenerate if we give them a chance very, very easily? So why aren't we using natural colonization, first of all? Uh, but secondly, you know, we're introducing a lot of plastics, or we have introduced a lot of plastics, but more fundamentally, we know that initially those landscapes are interesting for wildlife, but after canopy closure, the interest for birds plummets for 50 to 100 years, unless you intervene in those areas. Uh, butterfly populations plummet, um, and uh, other insect populations plummet, um, so we're not doing anything for the, uh, much of our biodiversity and the whole idea of canopy closure is to stop plants from growing. So you don't actually have interesting plants as well. So please tell me in these plantation schemes that we're so enthusiastic about what, what biodiversity that is actually going to benefit. Whereas compare that with the work that's been done at the Net Wilding Estate, immediately we have seen massive increases in biodiversity. And this year, 29 singing males of nightingales. That is just astonishing. The population of turtle doves is going up, whereas everywhere else in the country, it's going down. This is because of having this open landscape with plenty of scrub, uh, plenty of dung, plenty of uh, wildlife rich, uh, well, it's not quite yet there. The sward is still, still taking a bit of time to recover. But you can compare that. So why are we not doing much more of that in our landscapes? We know now, we've known now for 10 years that it works. So please tell me why we're not doing a lot more of that and much less of the standard plantation, which is good for tree growing if you want timber, but is not ideal for wildlife. Derek, tell us why. Okay, right, so to try and keep this cohesive, I've been making notes. Um, plantation forestry is as bad as intensive corn. And uh, yes, we need timber, but what the guys that grow it don't tell you is it will have three cycles and then the land you're using will grow bugger all. Okay, so it's, it's a charade. We're doing it because it's Sitka grows fast. It's something you can commercially protect. It's something you can basically quantify for carbon credits. That's why we're growing Sitka up here. Jill, I assume, is talking about a, a more enlightened kind of forestry. But even that more enlightened kind of forestry, the planting of, of deciduous trees in Britain is complicated, of course, by disease, and it's complicated by mammalian predators. What is the most significant mammalian predator of deciduous woodland planting? Squirrel. So there we go. We are living on an island where the animal that it takes the, the fate of a forest that will live for thousands of years is a bloody squirrel. And it's because we have killed all the predators of the bloody squirrels 
and the things like the Martins until two or three years ago were way up above the central belt of Scotland. The wildcats were confined to the far north. The goshawks, okay, they're gathering steam after falconers released them illegally in the 50s and 60s. But if you turn round to the rodents that run the administration of, of licensing, when it comes to creatures like these, they will tell you it's terribly difficult, terribly complex, and you can actually do bugger all. When it comes to forests and animals and time, you have to think about what time you're talking about. So when Jill Blesser talks about these big free roaming herbivores, there have been very few big free roaming herbivores in Britain since the Iron Age or beyond. The last of the aurochs finished then, the last of the moose finished then, the, the rhinos that survive the ice don't last, don't tolerate us for long. We finish them and we finish the horses. So the deer we're talking about by the time you get to Saxon and Norman times are tolerated and cultivated deer. Looking backwards is very difficult and what we've got to do now is look forwards. It doesn't, when we start to talk about rewilding and people think, seem to think it's something that's gone off like a big comet into the sky and at some point it's going to go bang and encompass the land. Do you actually know how many p potential acres are being rewilded now? Well, if you speak to Alistair Driver from Rewilding Britain, he will tell you that maybe, very liberally, 50,000 acres of Britain are either proposed or are being proposed for rewilding. Do you know how many acres in Britain are farmed? It's 23 million. And the bulk of that land could not be held for agriculture if it were not for public subsidy. If it weren't for public subsidy to keep the sheep industry on its feet in this landscape, keeping these mountains entirely denuded and bare, the thing would have finished in the 14th century. Never mind us having a love affair with, she with deer. We have a love affair that's very deep with sheep. And if you think that's wrong, go to any country fair through the long summer that's going to come and look at the people in white coats, polishing them, washing them in lux flakes, giving them names, putting wee coats on them, shining their little hooves, kissing them quite a lot. Not a good idea. It's a horrifying prospect that COVID's going to get into the sheep. Um, so when it comes to farming, it is really interesting to sit on platforms with people like you. Farming is actually not about going forward, well, it's about going forward with some good technology, and it may be also about going forward with some surprising technology like clean meat and protein synthesis, which could change very much to the point where we look back at where we are now and it becomes in its own right in our lifetime a black and white photo. But for those of you who've read a guy by, by a chap, uh, Farmer's Glory, a book by a chap called A.G. Street, or who've lived long enough, you realise that the farming systems we're talking about now, the regenerative farming systems, are where we were after the, first, the Second World War, before the government and the chemical companies that had been producing nerve gas and toxins and, and all sorts of abominations that we had no idea we have no idea of what they did then. We have no idea what they're going to do now. We have no idea how sustainable these things are going to be, but it's sure as hell beginning to look like they haven't got much of a future at all. By the time 79% of French children have got neonics in their spinal fluid, you know you're in big, big trouble, and yet people tell you it's safe. So what we're talking about here farming-wise is not looking forward. It's looking back to the days where we put dung in the soil and not chemicals, where we have mixed farming operations that are viable, which can use resource. It's not a waste. It's moving one thing around the farm to make sure it works in synchrony with something else. But it's bloody hard work. It's hard work. You have to have an imagination. You have to be an intelligent person. You have to be a person that can actually talk to other human beings as opposed to just talk to farmers, which is very easy because you all talk the same shit forever <laughs> and never disagree with each other. And it's these kind of things that we desperately need. The industry needs new blood. It needs new people with new ideas that are not held up with all the bollocks of the past and the idea that the EU is going to feather bed you forever and that you don't really want to go forward. You want to go back to all that money from you, the taxpayer, for doing bugger all. I'm a farmer, I'm a member of the NFU. I get £24,000 of your money every year for doing bugger all. Every year I look at my Land Rover and think, what am I going to do with this money? I'll just change the colour because I can't be bothered washing the old one. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. We should be, if we're going to get money, we should, be pay, we should be paid for doing things that are social goods. And that's what's coming, in theory at least, um, with the new environment bill 
and a new set of payment structures for farming. But already, quite commonly, you'll have seen it in the farming press, you've got you've got economists pointing out to farmers that this is actually a very raw deal. But you see that money you're going to get, you're actually going to have to spend some of it on doing things you don't want to do. So it's an industry that for way too long, and I'll finish on this note, has been like, it's been like a kind of Just William type book. You know, every time you criticise Just William or tell him that, you know, he's a bad boy, what you do is you stand there on the spot, hold your breath, jump up and down until you're going purple and then somebody gives you a lolly. As anybody here who is a parent will know, that spoilt children, at some stage, you can tolerate it for a little bit. But in the end, the best thing to do is, is bend them over and smack their arse very hard. <laughs> and what this industry needs now is a good arse smacking, and then it needs its hands held so it can move forward in a fashion that's sensible. Derek? I'm, I'm so glad someone's keeping this coherent and I'm also <laughs> delighted that we've managed to get our slapping into the conversation. It's not where I thought we'd end up going today, but this is definitely a topic that for another planted further down the track. But Ben, if I could just move to you for May, Tom, and I've got a question specifically about food uh, for you afterwards as well. But Ben, on Derek's point there about not putting muck on the fields anymore, I mean, how detrimental has this chemical processing of our of our soil been? I mean, and it, absolutely, as Derek said, you know, this is this is really something that came out of, of mass production of war machinery, really. Yeah, and it's I mean, it's not just Mark; it's the whole move towards specialist farming systems. So, you know, where does fertility come from? Fertility comes from the sun. You know, all fertility eventually comes from the sun. If it's you know, if you're putting in artificial fertilizer, that's come from oil, which is come from energy from the sun so eventually we're, it all comes back to that <clears throat> and what we've done since we started using more chemicals is we've been mining our you know our banked fertility for mil millions of years well we've now spent a lot of that we need to go back to using what we can earn every year um, so we need to capture that energy and that's what mixed farming is about you use your you know your nitrogen fixing plants and your, your grasses and you build a mixed lay that builds soil fertility um, and then, you know, if, it, if you've got animals and it gets eaten, then of course that dung is getting returned. So you're building soil organic matter and you're building soil life. And that's what, you know, when you've got a healthy soil full of organic matter and life, you don't need to put all this other stuff in because nature works, the system works. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, you know, chemicals get a lot of blame, rightly so, but actually it's the farming system that drives that. And, and even in intensive you know, certified organic system, there's still a lot of ploughing and ploughing damages the soil as well. It's a temporary damage. And if you've got it as a mixed rotation, the soil recovers. So, you, you know, it does a lot less damage. But anything that you do to the soil to produce food is damaging it. You know, in that ideal utopia, we're all in these rewilded farms where we just come along and harvest it. You know, that at the moment with our population, I don't think that that works. So we need to find something that does work, and that is much more about farming with nature. It's about understanding where your fertility comes from and, and being able to manage that. And, you know, there, there are, it, there have been, I don't know if there still are, but, you know, there have been dairy farmers that have added nitrogen to grassland. Well, actually, if you grow clovers, you don't need to. It's a, it's a weird thing where you spend money and you put the nitrogen on, it kills off the clovers because there's too much nitrogen. So, that, you know, so you've got this whole thin mindset of, of treating the soil in a way where sometimes it's totally unnecessary. Um, but we need to find a way to, to pull that back. And I, you know, I, don't, um, you know, I don't vilify farmers. I, don't think, you know, I think you know, clearly there are some awful farmers uh, who might need to be vilified. But most farmers actually have been driven by a system and by a, a price pressure on food that's forced them down certain routes I mean it takes a really imaginative farmer to fight against that and to find a way to to buck all of those economic pressures sometimes it's luck sometimes it's just that they're bloody minded but actually for most farmers it's really hard um, and and I think we need to help and support them and I think the public money for public goods that Derek talked about could do that um, you know for the first time we now do have financial support for natural regeneration of woodland. Um, the application form's a nightmare, um, so I don't know how useful it is, but you know, for the first time last year, you, know, you can get money to do that. So I think there are people in government now looking at this. There are some really good people in government that are trying to find a way through this. 
There are also an awful lot of people in government that have no idea what they're doing and need help as well. So I think a lot of it is about just trying to, to bring the right people together with the right, the right knowledge. Really important point there, Ben. I think about not looking to vilify farmers. It's, uh, it's a bloody tough job and, and the margins are tiny in the, the supermarkets, I guess, is that uh, of, of squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. I mean, Tom, from your perspective as someone who's, you know, talking to an audience of potential consumers of your, your products from, the, from, your, from your amazing farm just around the corner here near Bruton, um, what kind of attitude change are you seeing now? I mean, is, is there a real shift towards people demanding kind of provenance of their food? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's re very difficult because, we're, you know, I'm mainly looking at a, a small section of the society that I kind of interact with. But um, uh, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm heartened by the fact that, that, that you know, what we sell is selling well. Um, uh, but, yeah, um, uh, I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Uh, because, you know, from, from general agriculture and farmers generally, you know, they're producing generally a commodity that they don't actually have any idea about the value of or, or, or say and the value that they're actually going to be receiving from it. And there's all sorts of different people out there who are influencing how much that they'll actually be getting. And that's, that's always held on a global world stage. So if there's any issue over in a different country, then actually that can impact the, the value of what you're going to be getting. So from a farmer's perspective, um, and, I, and, I, and I think we're, we're slightly different to this because, and we're privileged in, in a way, because I have a direct we, we create a brand and I have a direct relationship with our consumer and that's really important. So engaging our customer and telling them about the, the problems, the moral dynamics of farming and producing food and the challenges that we, we have, I think is the, probably the most important thing that we possibly can. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a massive advocate of actually people reducing their meat consumption and also actually reducing their cheese consumption. That's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. Just make sure when you do purchase it, it's, it's decent stuff. It's your cheese. Well, no, actually, you, you know, and that that's wrong, wrong in itself. There's some amazing cheese. Like Jamie Montgomery does a great job. There's some there's there's all. And, and actually, I, I'm a massive believer in like a, a rising sea rises all ships. So making sure that there's good competitive edge is, is brilliant but, but the other thing as well is like is i've got no interest in in producing something that's um you know like consistent because because we live in a world that's totally inconsistent we're producing stuff that um as farmers that rely on uh, microclimates around our farm and actually this is one of the prob probably the other problems that we've found is that the um, people who are producing the commodity style foods, that's all they're interested in is consistency of making sure what, that it tastes the same as it did yesterday and the same as last year. Well, how the hell are you supposed to do that in a changing cli climate and environment? It's very, very difficult. So rather than trying to create that, we talk about it a bit more and go, do you know what, try a bit of this. This tastes totally different to yesterday. And so, <laughs> by the way, it, you know, and empowering those, um, those people behind the cheese counter or charcuterie counter to actually communicate that story, I think is really essential mm. and it's, it's fundamental. So it's up, it's up to us as Can I just add to one story to what you said, okay? That's intelligent thinking, okay? Mm -hmm. About four weeks ago, I had this wee guy come to a photography course on my farm, um, small, stocky man, beard. Um, he wanted to know what cattle we kept now. Uh, we don't keep very many cattle, so we had a bit of a chat while was there. And he said he keeps traditional Herefords. And I said, is that the small piggy things with horns? And he said, yep, I've got a herd of those. I have my own butchery. And um, so I said, are you a farmer? And he said, no, no, I'm the chief meat buyer for Weatherspoons. <laughs> and we got, had a really interesting conversation. And... Um, and I said, where, so where does your beef come from? He said, Namibia, Australia, somewhere else. Where would the somewhere else be? Maybe South America, okay? We only buy specific cuts, um, and, we, and we, it's all got to be female or male and specific cuts. And he said, and that's because if you go to Weatherspoons, how many people go to Weatherspoons? Come on, no <laughs> lying. Right, well, that's not much of a show. It's a National Trust property. If we'd have been more down market and we're looking at the Wildlife Trust, 50% would have been different. <laughs> so the point of that is that every time you go to Weatherspoons, your steak pie will taste exactly the same as the steak pie you had six years before, two years before, a month before. And he said, it's shit meat. 
He said, my boss told me two years ago we had to buy British beef. And he said, we tried to get British beef for six of our restaurants um, so we could say we were supporting British farmers. He said, the problem was it was all utterly inconsistent. He said, we got some Herefords, we got some Angusies, we got some Highlands, we got some Simmental Crosses. The buyers did their best to, to find and buy and produce good cattle. But it was all variable. And we had so many complaints from those six restaurants. We had more complaints from those six restaurants than we had from every other of the 200 pubs in our chain that we stopped at. So the problem is not these guys producing something unique. The problem is that there is a whole world of people out there that think they want uniformity. And farming is there, geared up now, to produce it. It's not clever. But that's what it's doing. I mean, you asked, do some farmers still put nitrogen in grass? Ha! Ah, you're kidding me. <laughs> Even if it's like 700 quid a tonne, these guys are like pouring it on. Yeah, I mean, there'll be some people that tell you we're putting on less. There'll be some people telling you we're trying not to pour it into the rivers now. But, yep, everybody's putting nitrogen in the dairy grass. We're not. Oh, yeah. apart, <laughs> apart from him, buy his cheese, okay? <laughs> nitrogen free. <laughs> So very much also up to the consumers to be open-minded, to educate themselves, and also to people like, like Tom's work at Westcombe Dairy, to actually exp try and look at the labels, look at what's the story behind this meat, where is it, or, or not just meat, cheese, whatever it may be, and actually don't buy South African apples in September, because we've got plenty of them here anyway, and it's really good, but be prepared for that diversity of taste as well. Um, Jill, could I just ask you now about... Um, changing tack just ever so slightly but just because I know you've got such a knowledge of this local area particularly in Woodland but I think we're all about planted about trying to change people's perceptions of nature and trying to make a commercial case for nature which we've talked a lot about in this in this conversation but could you just paint a picture I guess because it's really important I guess what we believe is normal that um, people talk a lot about shifting baselines don't we George Mombay talks about what one generation thinks is normal, uh, it was actually completely different. Are you able to kind of paint a picture of what this world around us may have looked like previously so we can kind of start to understand just how much it's changed and where we've come to? Well, um, I mean, if we, if we went back to even the Elizabethan times, um, very much of the area was not even uh, occupied by people as in farmsteads at all. So it was very much an open, open landscape. And I suspect that a lot of people were commoning and doing uh, what we would call transhumance here, you know, actually bringing their animals in from quite a long way away to actually graze this particular landscape. A huge core of this area would have been um, an, a, a very much more open landscape, not a fence in, inside. Um, but we, we have to, and there would have been, it would have been a very wet landscape because of the rivers that are uh, actually, uh, the headwaters are in this landscape. And in fact, you know, we know the story about King Alfred. Uh, he gathered his forces at the base of the hill, uh, hiding amongst the wetland woodland down there. Um, and it was a really uh, good cover for him uh, to gather his troops before he then went on to a great battle and you know then became uh, then we started to think about even becoming England this is predates um, the state of England really um, so it would have been and we know from the biodiversity and I, I take uh, Derek's point but I, I you know we have to be species many species have short lifespans so they have to have the right habitat to move to be able to their offspring to live in for that for those generations to go on and on and on particularly with insects that only have one year life life cycles for example they've got to be able to find those uh, habitats in the future and what we've been doing is uh, eliminating many of those habitats i mean this morning i read that um, our moth populations, even in woodland, which we're supposed to have uh, nice ancient woodland, um, the moth populations have, have absolutely crashed in our woodlands. And so this is just a picture of, you know, the numbers that have gone. I mean, 
I think we would have heard nightingales, we certainly would be hearing cuckoos at this time, we would have been hearing a lot of warblers coming into this landscape, that's the, just the birds, but of course we would have had the beavers and the beavers have come back, which is fantastic. Um, and there are moves to bring other keystone species back into this landscape to make that dramatic mosaic. And the more the mosaic, the more the species diversity. The less the mosaic, the less the species diversity. And that includes the soil. And particularly, I hear a lot about um, managing the soil, but I don't really hear a huge amount about getting the deep rooting species into the soil to help deepen the, the, the cross section of the soil to make it really rich. I hear about you know putting the nitrogen back through clovers and that's fantastic. But we used to have all our wonderful grassland species, they all have different root structures and different depths at which they root. And it's those roots which have the slime around them, which are the most active bit of the work in the soil. And if we just put in a monoculture, I'm afraid you not only lose that diversity, but you make yourself extremely vulnerable to poaching and animal damage, because, uh, and vehicle damage as well, um, because the structure of the soil has been completely taken away from aeration and and uh, and that stops nutrients moving easily. So I, I think we also need to think in terms of how we can get much better diversity of habitat back into the landscape in whatever way we can. Now we don't, we have in the forest of Selwood, we have got a very, very early stages of a facilitation fund group which brings together different types of landowners. We've got 40 of those, it's one of the biggest in the country and it's covering 4,000 hectares at the moment. And we, that is only a part of the forest of Selwood. And yes, that's early days and I'm sure Derek could say, well, you know, it's too, too little, too late and, you know, will you be able to influence them? Well, we in our community, we don't own the land and what we often see is the government subsidy going straight to the landowner, bypassing what the community is actually keen to see. And that's a real problem, I think, um, in these new subsidies that I don't think um, if the government or if these new subsidies that come in don't get it right, we're going to find that um, local communities are going to be very, very surprised at an alternative which is on their doorstep, unless we can persuade you know, unless we can get that right and we can persuade the, the, the community of landowners to diversify as well. So I'm not suggesting that everybody in the forest of Selwood will go wild. I just don't think it will happen. Many of them may not. But I'm hoping that we will get all of the... We will stop doing bad things. And I think that's still happening quite a bit. And Derek said that very eloquently but I'm hoping that we will have a lot of new happenings on those farms from uh, you know, uh, putting hedgerows in, et cetera, et cetera, right the way through to an absolute core of rewilding, which is more or less there in the forest of Selwood with threads down the river systems and across certain landscapes so that we have a core of the wildest merging out into less wild but still very very uh, biodiverse working with nature using nature as best we can thanks jill um guys i'm conscious we've only got about five minutes left so um i'm just going to go through across the panel if i may just for um one or two just uh, work on our audio moment there but uh, just in terms of uh what we can all do at home on an individual level um, because not all of us are lucky enough to own thousands of acres or hundreds of acres or even an acre so on a on a small level I, i'm guessing it's a reasonable bet that most people in the audience here are interested in how we can enable nature regenerate nature we we all recognize that there's a problem but we all want to be part of a solution so if i could perhaps starting at the far end there ben just just a couple of small tips that everyone can do at home which could just just help to start to change this this really quite terrifying 
drop off plummet in, in biodiversity. And the biggest thing you can do is decide where to spend your money. Um, you know, we all buy food every day. You know, it's a, it's a choice we make where, uh, what we buy, you know, what food we buy and where we buy it from. You know, so decide what matters to you and but find farmers that are selling things that you want to buy or food shops that are selling things you want to buy that will have a difference on the environment. Um, you know, so with agroforestry, for instance, there is now a market stall in London that sells produce from specifically agroforestry farms, farms that are using trees. I mean, that's one example. I've got another sitting next to me, you know. So, so you, you, know, you have that power in your pocket. The other thing is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate that we could become, again, as we once were, a nation of part-time farmers. We don't all have to earn all our living from growing food. You know, I am now a part-time farmer. I work partly for the Soil Association, I work partly for a farm. You know, and, a, and it gives me mental and physical health by having that split of, of mental activity and physical activity. And I think, you know, I've seen a lot of old broken farmers and I've seen a lot of people who are stuck in front of a screen every day. And I'm convinced <laughs> that having a bit of each would make everyone a little bit happier and it would make our food, it would transform our food system. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Ben. I couldn't agree more. Tom, you're not going to disagree with the line no. about buying off uh, specific farms, but no, I mean... I'm not not at all. But I think, like, as you know, I think always diversity is key. Really, I mean, like, don't just find one place. You know, yeah. um, like finding like. You know, and engaging with them, um, with who's actually producing the food, and actually really finding out the person, the people behind it. And if you've got, um, uh, if you like them and you like understand their values, then then actually that's that's really really good. But also the other thing that I would I would say is is just grow. Like like if you're not doing it already, just get in the soil and actually grow something because you'll have a totally different understanding of actually what it takes to to and the pitfalls of actually growing stuff. I mean, the, the amount of times that we've done vegetable growing and the bloody stuff hasn't worked or it's gone to hit set head too, too quickly. You know, this is what farmers are trying to do on a daily basis. So having that empathy by actually doing it yourself, I think is really important. And also getting your kids to do it. Like education is just like that's that's the next thing that I'd like to target. I think, you know, it's, it's why I'm so pleased to be here talking to you guys. But I feel like you're, you're kind of there. It, we need to get into schools, we need to get them young, we need to have this communication so that we're not focusing on, you know, maybe the whole kind of veganism or the vegetarian debate. It needs to be a holistic system that people really have a deep understanding and then they can make their choices. Thanks, Tom. Derek, I'm going to bypass you on this one because I rather suspect you might be the person to give the last word on this. But <laughs> Jill, to you, a couple of pointers that... Um, that for, for people at home, what can they do on a, on a, on a micro level? Uh, well, I went to Charlie Burrell, who is Netbury Wilding's new uh, site, which is in Lincolnshire, and it's um, you know a 600 hectare just arable landscape, basically, at the moment. And while we were looking at it, uh, we were talking about the dearth of wildflower seed that's available to actually do some of this uh, restorative work. We heard about it this morning, um, about how there's so little seed source are available. Now, what they're going to do there is they're working with Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust, who have identified where the road verges, because Lincolnshire has very wide road verges, where the best wildflower seed source is on the road verges, and they're going to source seed from that. And then, of course, they will start to develop their own high quality areas on the farm and then they've got a source themselves that they can start to build and, and grow themselves. But my point there is I think we need to understand our landscapes and where the really valuable bits of the landscape are and we probably need to ideally start gathering our own uh, see, seed because we don't really want to import that from, uh, from Europe and we don't really want to be importing trees from Europe because we have well, while many of those diseases and pests and things would probably get here under their own steam, let's not 
accelerate the process, because that's like COVID, isn't it? If you accelerate the process, you overwhelm the system. So let's slow that process down by having our own seed sources. But I've been involved in two citizen science projects. Um, one is the ancient tree inventory, collecting information about ancient trees. And I think it's a really powerful tool. So I think we all can get involved in citizen science type projects um, and actually you, through those contribute to an overall greater good. Brilliant stuff. And I'd add as well, if you do want to plant some wild seeds at home, we've got a fantastic uh, brand in the botanical market, Bee Bombs, my friend Ben Davidson in there. Um, so go into the botanical market after this and, uh, and buy some wildflower seed and go home and give the pollinators a, a chance in there. But Derek, if I could just leave it for you, uh, please, to give a cup your, your strongest advice you can give to people at home and what they can do to help affect change. It's all about people, it's all about you. But at the end of the day, the cavalry aren't coming. If change is going to come, it's going to come from people like you. And it's as simple as that. Individuals change everything. It is about money. It is about going to people like him and buying his nice cheese. And then it's about turning around at that counter and saying, how are your dragonflies doing this year? What's your farmland bird inventory like? Do you have harvest mice in your land? When was the last time you saw a glowworm? Because it has to be a partnership between farming and space for other things. It can't be one thing or the other. The next thing I'd say to you is, see that thing you've got called a garden? Forget it. You know, just go out there, dig a big hole in the middle of it, make it wet, let scrub come in, dump rocks in there, let rock, let logs rot down, get what wildflower seed you possibly can, start to make it a diverse living space for other creatures. There are lots of people who have gardens, the acreage of gardens in Britain is phenomenal, and gardens by and large are much, much better living spaces for a whole array of wildlife now than the farmlands are. And then take your money. If you've got spare money and you want to do something for nature and spend it with the organisations that really do things. Spend it with the people that don't play politics and don't have big budgets and don't have fleets of vehicles and don't have big swish carpets um, in their offices. Give it to people like Roy Dennis who are going to reintroduce white-tailed eagles to the Isle of Wight come what may and who are absolutely committed to their last dying breath and to making this planet a better place. That's what I would advise you to do. Fantastic stuff. Thank you, Derek. Indeed, thank you all the panel, Ben to Tom, Derek and Jill. It's been absolutely fascinating. It really has. And I apologise. Well, maybe I don't apologise for not putting out to questions just this one time because we have a slightly larger than normal uh, panel in terms of numbers. And I think the, the quality, I think you'll all agree, and the knowledge and the expertise that they've all brought to the table here has just been absolutely wonderful. And I'm personally really humbled that you've come to plant it to uh, to speak with us today. So thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.